magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about a cool trick for casual play, the post-Eldari Codex 9th edition 40k version of the Mind War combo. It's way better than it was in 8th. It's uh, super cool, lots of fun, great for casual games, and nobody's talking about it. Uh, I will say I'm not advocating that you take this to any GTs or run it against your friend who wins more than she loses at GTs because it's this is... This is a, this is a casual grade super trick. It's not it's not going to win you major tournaments. I'll, at the end of the video, I'll talk about why. Because for some of you who maybe only play casually, you're going to listen to this and think, "Wow, that sounds amazing." But there are some reasons why, in higher levels of play, it's not a great investment. But at your friendly local game store, in in casual and pseudo competitive 40k, this is super fun, really powerful, highly thematic. It tells a really interesting story on the table that's very appropriate to Craft World Eldar. And best of all, because it has a bunch of moving parts and requires synergies between stratagems and psychic powers and unit placement and clever tricks, it will give you that sense of aesthetic, aesthetic satisfaction and completion that the, the best maneuvers in 40k provide for us, and it will cause your opponent to blink and shock and then perhaps pee a little, which is also satisfying. Basically, what we're trying to do when this goes well is use a, a clever cocktail of powers to assassinate an enemy character early on, maybe on turn one, and uh, hopefully also roll one of your opponent's flanks, not in a way that will cause you to then just go through the whole army like butter, but a way in which will cause them to have to scramble to respond. And while they're trying to deal with the, the threat on their flank or in their backfield, you'll be able to run the table in the middle of the board and hopefully win the game that way. So here's what you need to do this minimally. Minimally, you need, there are a couple of versions of this. You can sort of keep investing in it to make it more awesome. Uh, the absolute minimum investment is a Falcon anti-grav tank, a foot farseer, and four warlocks, which you can see on screen right now. Oh, and as I make this video, some of you are going to be tempted to say in the comments, Brent, you know, it would have been really helpful. Uh, you could have put up images of the stratagems that you're talking about and the data sheets. Yes, I could have. Uh, and I could have shown you images of my own Phoenix Lords and, and Hemlock Wraith Fighter. I'm just really squished for time right now, guys. And I'm, I'm banging this video out in between uh, family obligations and work stuff. So post-production on this is limited. Uh, I, I always appreciate little notes in the comments about how I can make the videos better. But um, let's, just, let's just leave those out for... The, I, I know. I know that's, I know that's preferable. So you need those models, and you are going to outfit the, the Farseer. Uh, it doesn't matter if you give him the spear or not, whatever. But for his psychic powers, he obviously needs Mind War. It's the title of the video. And after that, I suggest either Doom or Executioner, depending on what else you're running here. Uh, probably Executioner is the better bet. The Warlocks, the four Warlocks, will need Embolden Horrify. Uh, some of you have already guessed that. And then in addition, again, it's kind of up to you. It's flexible. I like uh, Protect Jinx. Oh, there's also a version in the Farseer build. There's also a version of this where Ghost Walk is the right second power. And I'll talk about why later. But for, for most of us, I think uh, Executioner or maybe Doom is going to be the move. The loadout on the Falcon is up to you. That Pulse Laser is really good. Uh, Sort of the other weapon kind of depends on points. This thing is probably not going to survive for a long time, so I, I wouldn't trip it out too much. But if your meta tends to be hard target, heavy, uh, a, you know, a Bright Lancer, a, maybe even a Star Cannon is not a bad idea. Um, otherwise, the Scatter Laser or the Shuriken Cannon is fine. Now, ideally, if you're going to go all out on this, you also need a Hemlock Wraith Fighter and a Phoenix Lord. I really like uh, Mogan Ra for this. Can't remember if I already said that, but any of those Phoenix Lords who are not Baharath will will work great. They're fine. I think the best ones are probably uh, Mogan Ra and maybe Azerman, but Karn Dross, freaking fabulous, and you you could totally use Jane Zar. So or Fugan, frankly, this could be your opportunity to to bring Fugan to the table. So some Phoenix Lord that doesn't get a lot of play. 
uh, this, this, is, this is a chance to get them on the table. And there are other units that also can have good synergy. You have a lot of other options for what else you might run with this if you're going to try to run a whole, uh, roll a whole flank. And I'll talk about those other options later in the video. I'll, I will give some love to units that don't necessarily see a lot of love these days. So here's, here's how this works. You deploy the, the Falcon with the Farseer, the Warlocks, and hopefully a Phoenix Lord, not absolutely necessary in the Phoenix Lord, in Deep Strike. So you use that Falcon power, you put them into Deep Strike. The uh, Hemlock should be deployed late in deployment at the very back of your deployment zone as far as possible from your opponent's heavy weapons. Against some opponents, even if you don't get first turn, they just won't have anything with a long enough range to target the Hemlock Wraith Fighter. If they do, if you're like playing Knights or something, and they do get first turn, then you use Phantasm to pick up the Hemlock and put it into uh, reserve. Um, if, if they just have like three LAS cannons or something, that's not going to kill it. But um, if, if they have enough firepower to really mess it up, then you, you, you want to use Phantasm. Now, if you get first turn, you look at the board and you ask yourself, does my opponent have a key character, preferably on a flank, not right in the middle of the board, uh, within 18 inches of somewhere that I can drop the Falcon? If yes, you do the thing. If no, you wait. Sometimes we find ourselves using this uh, in turn two. You, you really want to have used it, I think, by that you could do it in three. You really want to use it by two. Uh, when your opponent has started to push into the midfield a bit, Sometimes this is a reactionary move, right? Your opponent starts to push into the midfield and you use it to sort of roll that prong of your opponent's attack. Um, but if, if you can hit them with it on turn one, that's great. And it's, it's solid if uh, your opponent doesn't have the firepower to target the hemlock or, or the range, but does get first turn. Arguably, that's sometimes even the, the, the best outcome. But what you're looking for is a spot where you can come within 18 inches of a key enemy character and you drop the Falcon in, the Farseer and the Phoenix Lord and the Warlocks all pop out. Uh, and if you have the Hemlock on the board, that zips over to be well within 12 inches of the enemy character that you're planning to target. And then close enough to what, so the, the Hemlock is going to know Smite plus something else. Honestly, any of the runes of battle offensive powers, because it only knows the offensive power that uh, you haven't already given to your Warlocks, is is a totally reasonable pick. So if you gave your Warlocks Embolden, Horrify, and Protect Jinx, then I, Reveal can be good. Uh, if you, And your, your meta has a lot of stuff that saves on a two-up and cover. If you expect to en encounter a lot of melee counter punchers, um, Restrain, Enervate, and Drain are all really solid. It's, it's up to you. Lots of options. But if your opponent lets you, you want to position the Hemlock such that that character that you're trying to take out is the closest the closest target, so you can use Smite for that. Probably your opponent will not allow that. You can also use the base of your Hemlock to make it difficult for your opponent to position models such that they are engaged in melee with your Farseer and... Uh, Warlocks, especially if your opponent has big base models, that might be a thing you want to think about. That's kind of an advanced technique. Uh, but your your Hemlock will zip across the board. And then in the Psychic phase, you start by casting Embolden Horrify with your Warlocks. And you're going to use a stratagem for this. It's called Battle Psychers. It costs 2 CP. And what it does is when you succeed on one cast, the Warlocks manifest both versions of the power. So you want to have a Strands of Fate die set aside for this if possible. Uh, if you're running Ulthway, this is your first cast, so you're at plus one. If you are running Children of Prophecy, you get a bonus that way. Um, but you definitely need this to go off. So Strands of Fate is super helpful because with a Warp Charge value of seven, if you have a Strands die for the cast, it literally can't fail unless your opponent has something to deny. And that's one of the reasons why it's helpful to run one of these craft worlds that gets casting bonuses, just to make it harder to deny the power. So presuming you succeed with the right bonuses you should, you get to trigger both Embolden and Horrify. So you put Horrify on the enemy character you want to target with Mind War. That gives them minus two to their leadership. And you give your Farseer uh, Embolden, providing your Farseer with 
plus two to her leadership, which takes your Farseer's leadership to an 11 and is probably bringing your opponent down to a seven, but in some cases it will be even a six. It also inflicts uh, fight last till your next psychic phase. That's a, a cool extra side effect of Horrify. So should the character survive and be some sort of like melee character, like a demon prince or something, that's also a big, uh, big penalty. And it gives your Farseer fight first. Hopefully that doesn't come up. And then you want to cast either Jinx or uh, Smite. If there's something nearby that deserves smiting, that where those mortal wounds really count, uh, by all means, just smite a thing. If not, Jinx is, re Jinx is really good. If you're playing against uh, an opponent who has a, a units in cover with a two-up save, J uh, Jinx is practically essential, especially against Armor of Contempt. And then for your next Psychic uh, activation, you want to activate the Farseer. Now, if you're running Ulfway, you lead with Mind War because Ulfway Psychers get plus one to their first cast. And ideally, you would have two strands of Fate Dice for this. So you would, for the second die, uh, you would select, or for the second, you would assign the second die uh, to the Farseer for Mind War. So you'd start with a six on one of your dice. You'd roll the second. It's a casting value of seven. At that point, you can't fail. And Ulfway Psyker will be at plus one to cast. And if you... If you need the the other thing you can do to make this more reliable is before the game to make the four warlocks with the seer uh, a seer council. The only issue with this it gives the far seer plus one to all her casts. The only issue with this is with the new CP economy. It can be hard to find the points for this because you're already blowing two CP on the warlocks. Uh, in this list, you probably want to backline far seer with fateful divergence to help you generate a point each turn. And it just won't give you a lot of other CP to spend on stuff like relics or warlord traits or, or additional detachments. It's, it does become a CP hungry move. But you could use Seer Council. If you don't have any other bonuses to your Farseer, you do really need that. So you could spend a CP before the game starts to make your Warlocks bodyguards for your Farseer and to give your Farseer plus one to their casts. So if you're Ulfway at this point, you would be at plus two. If you also have a Strands of Fate die, that's great. It's really hard to deny you. Now, when Mind War goes off, it works like this. Uh, you choose an enemy Psyker within 18 inches of the Farseer, and you roll a d6. You add the d6 to your Psyker's leadership, and your opponent rolls a d6 and adds their leadership characteristic to the roll. And then you do Mortal Wounds equal to the difference. Now remember, you cast Embolden on your Farseer, so your Farseer is at an 11. And Horrify was cast on the other enemy character, who maybe started at a 9 and is now at a 7, but with the Hemlock Wraith fighter nearby, the Mind Shock pod on the Hemlock Wraith fighter will push your opponent's leadership down to a 5. And if your opponent started at an 8, now it's down at a 4. But let's assume that it's, it's at a 5. So if we get pretty average rolls on the 2d6, let's say we both roll the same. I'm doing six mortal wounds. Uh, if I happen to outroll you even by one or two, I'm doing seven or eight mortal wounds. If I roll well and you roll poorly, potentially I'm doing more than 10 mortal wounds. Now, if you if you manage to position the Wraith Fighter close enough, the Wraith Fighter may then be able to cast Smite on the same character. Uh, that kind of requires a player on your opponent's part, but it could... It could be the case. And if the character that you're targeting is something really powerful that started with more than nine wounds, your Farseer could, just to finish it off, reach out and touch it with Executioner, which can target a character if it has uh, a wounds characteristic of 10 or more. Now in the shooting phase, so, I mean, that's that's the Mind War trick. The Mind War trick is I'm attempting to do six plus mortal wounds to uh, an enemy character that your your opponent thought was safe and hopefully blow their head off. There's a, a lot of key characters in the game that, that this will kill. And you can also use it to cripple some big baddie. And maybe once we add in other shooting or other psychic powers, uh, kill the big baddie that way. But it's not over because when the shooting phase rolls around, you, you actually have some pretty significant damage output. That Hemlock Wraith Fighter has uh, the heavy D, two heavy D sides, so it's going to put out 2D6, strength 12, minus 4, flat 2 shots with blast that inflict a mortal wound in addition on 6s. And that's really good for picking up 
uh, two wound heavy infantry, space marines, uh, chaos space marines, rubric marines. And if that's what was screening that enemy character, potentially the Wraith Fighter can pick up all of that stuff or enough of it that Lookout Sir isn't functioning anymore. And then your uh, Phoenix Lord and your Falcon can just light up the character and finish off that character if it was something pretty powerful. Or the Phoenix Lord and the Falcon can put the hurt on other backline units that are on that flank and we're, we're running with that character model. And the pulse laser on the Falcon is no joke. 48 inches, heavy two, strength nine, minus three, D3 plus three damage. You've also got some shuriken catapults on there, unless you've replaced those with a shuriken cannon, which you, you might wanna do. And then whatever the other heavy weapon you took is, you have that also. And then of course you have your Phoenix Lord. Now, I mentioned Mogan Ra because Mogan Ra has a pretty, uh, flexible shooting profile and then has some good melee counterpunch and the model's beautiful. We're not getting to use Mogan Ra much. Mogan Ra put out Assault 6, Strength 7, Minus 2, Flat 2, and unmodified wound rolls of 6 inflict additional mortal wounds. Uh, you can then attempt a charge roll if you have a CP you and you can re-roll the charge, then it's not horrifically unlikely at 9 inches. Uh, it is unfortunate that you can't cast ghost walk on the phoenix lord because the phoenix lord although it is a character doesn't have a craft world trait and the way ghost walk is phrased is you need that craft world trait in brackets even if you're not able to get the charge off though one of the nice uh aspects of having a phoenix lord there is that depending on how you can position it if your opponent tries to come at you with some melee thing you can heroically intervene uh and remember embolden inflicts fight last, um, which will cancel with the charge, but nevertheless, uh, Mogan Ra's got a, a decent melee profile. Asterman's great in melee. Uh, Karendross is good. I do think you want something with some shooting. So I, Karendross is probably a more mar marginal choice for this. Um, Fugin in certain metas, but the ability to heroically intervene definitely counts for something. And because the Phoenix Lords are damage gated, they can't take more than three wounds in a phase. Uh, that provides a durable threat that will take some resources for your opponent to try to chew through. And of course, you have the resurrection strat to fall back on. Now, I mentioned that this... Uh, oh, the other th reason that I like Mogan Ra, uh, almost forgot. So he's got this ability called Doom Incarnate. Each enemy model that is destroyed by an attack made by this model counts as two models in the morale phase. And in combination with the Mind Shock pod on the hemlock. So all of the enemy units within 12 inches are at minus two to their leadership. So if Mogan Ra takes out a couple of models, now they're actually rolling on, they're, they're adding four, right? So that it's, and because we are now in an economy where people sometimes don't have the CP for insane bravery, because we're starting the game with less, um, your opponent just might not be able to prevent failing a morale test. And even if she can, Using the CP to do that will keep her from doing something else early in the game when she really needs it. So that's just another fun synergy that you get by putting uh, Mogan Ra on the table. Again, this is not a this is not intended to be a build you're going to take to a GT or something, but that's a cool, fun thematic synergy that can get you something. Okay, I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I was going to suggest that there's some other units that work well in this combo. Uh, if you if you really want to commit to trying to roll the opponent's flank, you can give yourself some support with striking scorpions who can forward deploy. If you don't get first turn, you pick them and the Wraith Fighter up with Phantasm. If you do, they can help you jump in there. And this is where you might want something like um, Ghost Walk to help them reach a slightly further away target. Uh, striking scorpions hit really hard. And they don't have great AP, so Jinx. I mentioned Jinx before. If the if you took the Warlock Jinx power, whatever they're hitting can benefit from Jinx. You might those of you who are just itching to use the Shroud Runners because Shroud Runners can make a pregame move and then move again. Your Shroud Runners can appear alongside your Falcon on this flank and put down some pretty withering anti infantry fire with the three scatter lasers that are still hitting on twos. And if you stick them in cover, they'll be saving on a two up. Uh, which is which is solid, right? Um, 
and again, what we're doing here is we're creating this threat on the flank that the, this is going to be resource intensive for your opponent to deal with that does a bunch of damage. And then while your opponent's dealing with that, you use your other units to control the middle of the table. War walkers, because they can scout deploy, you can potentially have a walker and they move 10 inches somewhere in the midfield that like runs out and helps with this. So the idea is you put a, a big enough block of stuff. And I like, I like the Walker and the uh, Shroud Runners too, because they're for their points, they're reasonably durable. And between the tank, the Lookout Sir characters, or uh, Farseer and the Damage Gated Phoenix Lord and whatever else you're throwing in there, you can really, you can really create a problem in your opponent's backfield um, on turn one. If you're really lucky, you they won't be able to deal with it, and you'll be able to to pull this off a second time. In most cases, though, I mean the the warlocks because they don't have lookout, sir. You can pretty much figure that they're doomed. You can sort of uh, you sort of try to block line of sight with the falcon. Uh, you you might be able to pull that off. Uh, maybe they can pop out of the Falcon in such a way that they are behind terrain. Ideally, you want to keep all of this as much out of sight of, depending on how the deployment zone is set up, you, you don't want your entire opponent's backfield to be able to see this. And if you're using an official GW terrain setup or the kind of setup that Games Workshop suggests for Ninth Ed, they won't be able to. Right. I mean, it's it's supposed to be a terrain rich board, but I know some game stores are still studying out terrain like it was seventh or eighth edition. And it's just, it's, it's, there just isn't enough there. And those are not great boards to, to try to do this on, but in anything resembling the kind of board we're supposed to be playing on, there should be an opportunity to hide this stuff from a significant portion of your opponent's list, such that even if they can destroy it, they're, they're moving models. They, they probably can't take out all of it. And uh, it's, it's pulling pressure off other parts of the table. And again, if you're reinforcing with war walkers and shroud runners and um, maybe scorpions, then they're not going to be able to kill all of it. They're going to do some serious damage. At least most lists won't. They'll do some serious damage, uh, but you, you might even get a second round of some murder. Last thing, it's okay to be a little conservative with this. You, you don't want to be so bloodthirsty with this combo that you, you, you do it on turn one when you shouldn't. When the thing that you can kill just really isn't worth it and you end up trading, you don't want to trade a falcon four Warlocks, a Farseer, and a Phoenix Lord to kill a Space Marine Captain and nothing else. You don't want to do that. Uh, again, something like Space Marines, usually you are going to be able to take out enough, enough other stuff that you will neuter their ability to hit you back, and then it's kind of fine. But don't, but don't do this in a way that causes you to make a really bad trade, even if it means you have to hang back and let your opponent uh, push forward a little bit. Lastly, before somebody points this out in the comments, I will acknowledge that there, there is a reason to think about leaving the Falcon at home and taking the Webway Gate instead. And that is that the Webway Gate it has the inspiring keyword. It will increase your Farseer's leadership by a further plus one. It doesn't have the firepower of the Falcon, of course. I don't love this simply because uh, it's easy for your, the, your once the webway gate is on the field, it's not going anywhere. And so it's easier in the Falcon for you to dictate the location and circumstances of engagement. But on the other hand, if you're running hidden path and your opponent, you know that your opponent is committed to trying to oppose the gate, then this might actually be freaking fantastic with webway gate. And then you could even bring those units out screened by something pretty durable, uh, that will give them some survivability and just be yet an extra big F you don't come near this part of the field. If you bring any of your powerful characters anywhere near my webway gate, I'm going to blow their heads off. Uh, and if you know that that's your meta, then potentially that's a, that's a killer combo. You, you lose out on the opportunity to, to do it as an ambush. It becomes a deterrent instead. So I, I think it's totally legit. It's just it's just a different way to think about how you can use this combo. It's it's no longer an ambush move. Now it's now it's something else. But that's what I've got. The mind war combo. Super cool, but just uh it's just for for competitive play, A, it's not reliable enough because people tend to if you're if you're playing this into something like Thousand Suns or High Fleet Leviathan or anything with really good psychic denial, the chances of you being caught 
having some powers denied and then, or even gray knights. Oh goodness. They're not super meta right now, but even still the chances of you being caught flat footed with this and your psychers not being able to pull their powers off is too great. There, there is an Ulthway artifact that lets you make casts undeniable on uh, a nine up and with strands of fate in your initial plus one to cast and see your council. Um, you would auto succeed on mind war on anything, but a one, if you put focus well on the far seer, you get there all the way, but that's too many resources. Um, but then the, the potentially the warlock power can be denied. So even if you, if it's their first cast and you use the strands of fate, they start at a minimum roll of an eight, but even still denial is a concern. And I think what you would find if you tried to use this in higher levels of competitive play is that like in one in three games, it would work great. Uh, and in, in one of those games, it would like, uh, not really earn and, and at times it would just be a disaster and that's just not it's just not reliable enough for uh more serious competitive play in in all comers matchups but at the casual level it's totally fun and awesome so there it is uh mind war combo if you liked this video i hope that you will click like if you uh want to help my algorithm you could leave a comment below if you have a comment to leave you could leave a comment below. If you want to obtain early access to videos, you could become a Patreon. And I am so close to having the number of Patreons that I want in order to start a, a Discord. So maybe you, maybe you could be the person that makes that happen. Thanks, everyone. I know this one was short. I hope to be back soon with some new content. I have a lot of stuff in the work. But as I said, things are also a little crazy right now. So uh, some of the videos that I hope to have out by the end of July will get kicked back to August. And I do have one quirky, really different thing that's coming very soon that's, that's basically ready to go. Okay, until then, thanks, take care, and best of luck in your next campaign.